Hey, everybody. Welcome to the August 2021 LA PPG meeting. It's great to have you here with us. We're so thrilled to have two of our friends from OWC. We have uh, Steven Nijelski, the Senior Workflow Engineer, and we have Sam Mestman, hello, the Chief Workflow Architect at OWC. And I think you guys have stuff for us on hybrid production workflows for 2021 and beyond. Is that correct? I think that's correct. I hope so. (laughs) Us too. Hopefully it's useful. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for being here. I'm going to hop off. And Sam, if you want to take it away, that would be great. Thanks again, guys. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much for having us. It's awesome to be back. Quick shout out to any of my We Make Movies people who are somewhere infiltrating this crowd out there. I miss you guys. And uh, it's good to be back at LAPPG. And one of these scenarios may apply to you today, but all of them may apply to you at some point over in the coming years. And depending on where you're working and how you're working, you may even have multiple of these scenarios applying to you in a single day. We'd like to think about these three core principles that really come into play no matter what kind of workflow you're designing. And the three core principles uh, are footage integrity. And basically what we mean by that is that you need to design a workflow that ensures your footage uh, safely gets to where it it needs to go and it's not lost along the way. And really think about that from an image pipeline perspective, which is you might you spend all this time and money to record uh, media, you know, in a camera. Right. But then that camera needs to make it onto likely a DIT's hard drive. And then that DIT's hard drive needs to make it back to an editor or multiple editors or possibly remote collaborators. And what you need to make sure is that the same thing that you spent all this money to shoot on set and that is living on that card is the same thing that your editors will be approaching later and that they know how to look at what what you're doing. So that's that's kind of what we mean by footage integrity in the real world. The next key principle is footage quality. And what we mean by that is, you know, when you are working in a hybrid workflow environment, you often have to do things like proxy workflows, things that are going to knock the quality down in order to get an edit completed. The key component is to make sure that you have thought it through so that you can relink back to your original camera files, make sure you have the highest quality for finishing, for color, for any kind of VFX, things like that. And on a practical level there, this is a big one that is a problem in remote workflows, especially because so many people are working with proxy. People like talk cloud workflow is a big buzzword right now. Well, cloud workflow for the most part at this point lives in a proxy mode. And then sometimes people may work in a proxy mode or with smaller resolution files that then somehow find a way to have themselves appear on your YouTube channel at a lower resolution, at a lower resolution and lower quality. Uh, or you may find that, you know, whether people are sharing stuff through things like Zoom, Teams, et cetera, you may start to get lower integrity recordings, et cetera, and managing that image pipeline and making sure that things are done at the highest quality and resolution and then get out in the correct aspect ratio and other places onto the desired platform is a big key in workflows uh, that we're seeing right now. All right, and the third one, this is the most basic function of any workflow is to get the footage to the people that need it to do their part. And so uh, everything we talk about today, we're going to come back to these three principles, or at least they'll apply to all the different uh, scenarios that we talk about. One more thing we want to talk about is to define the word collaboration. It's a great word. It's thrown out all the time. Uh, but what does it actually mean? What is that? What is it? What are people referring to when they say collaboration? Sure, we're collaborating. Uh, one of the most basic versions of that can mean that you have one pool of media and multiple editors working on different projects. This most often in my experience comes out when you have maybe somebody working on a long form version of something, somebody else is working on social media cut downs, things like that. So that's a very common way to to collaborate, but there are other ways as well. All right, another way that's super common, uh, and this can be very efficient if you've got people who specialize in one area or another, you can have a project that migrates from one person to the next and you've got maybe an assistant editor that gets things kicked off, hand it over to an editor, then it goes on for final color, then maybe someone else is gonna be doing graphics or visual effects, you name it. But it's that kind of hopping through from one person to another kind of a collaborative workflow. And then the next one, the most complex version is gonna be when you have a like DaVinci Resolve, Adobe Teams or Avid Bin Locking where you're in a true real time, people, multiple people are have the same project open simultaneously working together. And so really all of those are collaboration. And so depending on how you, what your needs are, if you need different levels of this type of collaboration, you have to keep that in mind when you're, when you're designing everything. 
and one thing that I'll mention is it's not it, it's sometimes <laughs> all of the people may be collaborating in this way across all of these things in, in a similar fashion. So, you know, collaboration can definitely be a buzzword in terms of like, how do we collaborate? But really, um, as you assemble your strategy, which is really what happens, it should start at the beginning with thinking through the different variables that you're in and assembling the best content pipeline for what you're trying to do. And then looking at the limitations, whether it's on the hardware side, budget side, or software side, and really thinking those through as you get from one collaborator to another. And our goal at OWC is to present strategies for you to be able to do that no matter which of these definitions of collaboration you're sort of using. Let's take a look at, this is a little bit of a teaser to, you know, what a, what a fully fledged uh, hybrid workflow might look like. And Sam will kind of walk us through what that, each of these pieces is. All right. So what is this diagram here? We've got a lot of different things that are kind of going on and we've got some arrows pointing out, but really if you look at it from left to right, it represents uh, really, you know, on the left, you've got uh, the jellyfish in the middle, which is kind of a video server and some user computers are kind of floating around it. In this case, an iMac Pro and a, and a, and a Mac Pro. Uh, but really, the, these represent seats where people might be collaborating in an office across some centralized storage. So that works great when you work in an office. But then what happens if you're in a hybrid workflow where you might sometimes be uh, a remote collaborator to that office, or sometimes you might be in the office and might be working, uh, you know, remotely to a home office. And there's really two ways, uh, you know, pretty clean ways to start collaborating from an in-office setting to a home setting. And it's really kind of outlined by these two different paths. On the top one, you have the cloud, where basically you might have a syncing tool to be syncing something that's in the office or at home or using cloud and, and sort of review. And, and there's a variety of ways to sort of use the cloud and leverage it. But you probably have some kind of home storage that it is or home computer that you were syncing to from something that lives at work. Or you were using a shuttle drive, uh, in this case, an Envoy Pro on the bottom there that we have and uh, which we'll be giving away uh, tonight. So uh, stay tuned. These things are awesome. They are crazy fast transfer drives that uh, basically um, I would say is probably the best editing drive to work on that is portable. Uh, and, and the bottom line is you might be taking this either between a home setup that has a RAID attached to it or a laptop, or you might be, uh, but the bottom line is that you're taking this drive as a shuttle between your home and your office and uh, essentially collaborating that way. And this is just a, a solid way to move media on a physical level to and from. And basically there are three modes if we kind of think about it as an editor, you're either and always a sometimes or a never, or like Sam said before, it's sometimes you're all three. Uh, always editors are working in the office 100% of the time. Sometimes editors uh, are gonna be bouncing back and forth. It might be within the same week, it may be like one week they're remote, one week they're local, and they come in on Monday to get footage, the rest of the week they're remote. But whatever that looks like for you, that would put you in the category of a, a sometimes editor. And then a never editor is someone who, they can be cross country, they can be on a different continent, whatever it might be there, they can be an integral part of your team that you work with every day, but they never come to the office. And so we're gonna look at all three of these scenarios today. And for some people who are freelancers or who might work with a company or have their own business, you might be a always collaborator who's going into the office, working with someone who's a sometimes collaborator, who sometimes comes into the office and then sometimes works from home. Uh, and meanwhile, you might own your own business as an always collaborator, but might be a never collaborator with other businesses or other clients where you might be a remote collaborator on some of these things. So you may switch these roles throughout the day. So knowing how each of these works and the optimal strategy, depending on what type of client or business you're running or, or how you manage your projects can be really important. And, you know, these are it's just in the world that we live in now, these the best way to approach is think about what role you play within a given project. Let's take a look at the first example. This is going to be the most simple, the one that everyone here I'm sure is familiar with. This is going to be your, your always editor, one person all by themselves. And so clearly, you know, what we've got here is your typical workstation. You're going to have some docs, peripherals, card readers, things like that. And then you're going to have storage. And really, this is the most straightforward, but the idea here is to sort of think this through and build it out where like, okay, this is where everyone typically starts. It's a single 
uh, computer in an office. And the way to approach this is, especially when you're dealing with storage and data, you want to kind of think about, hey, what's the, the size of the project that I'm going to work from? And then you want to think a couple years down the line and you want to plan for some growth. You don't want to buy a drive that is just going to be enough to, and maybe a little bit more to manage a single project. You want to start thinking strategically, and then you want to start gradually thinking things like backup, et cetera. The drives that we have pictured there are OWC solutions. Uh, and, and basically, we've got the Flex 8 and uh, the Thunder Bay uh, over there, which are very similar. And the only difference between those two is that the Thunder Bay also includes dock and uh, includes a PCI card slot in there all-in-one as a drive. It's a great sort of all-in-one package that you can have that connects to an in-house uh, storage, but it's really not any different than the Thunder Bay in that it's an eight drive bay. And the Thunder Bay also has four drive, uh, but these are what we call large raids, where if you're gonna build the foundation around a large amount of media and you know you're gonna be cycling a lot of media for a single person, it's a great place to start. Uh, and then on the right hand side, we've got a dock over there. So, and this is a great thing to build around in terms of having a lot of different types of drives cards, media that might be coming in, uh, and being able to run this through an OWC as a host of different docs for that reason. Anyone with any questions, just ask in the chat which one's right for your needs. So once you move from a single editor to multiple editors, in this case, we're showing five, uh, but it could be as, as simple as just two, um, you know, you initially just duplicate everything you did before. And then you've got, you got uh, separate RAID storage for every work, every editor, everyone's got good speeds, you've got some redundancy, this is looking good. Then um, if any, anyone who's worked in this environment knows, uh, suddenly you're going to have this person maybe over here uh, sick on Friday, but this project needs to be done by the end of the day. So now you need this editor to be able to jump on her workstation and, and help out, or you need some graphic files from this person over here. And you know how it goes. So suddenly everybody's needing stuff from everybody. And how do you solve that? Well, you start out by throwing things like thumb drives for smaller files, or you start buying a bunch of little shuttle drives that you find on Amazon or something. And then you start to find out you're running out of storage, so you buy more storage. Well, this, this is you're pretty clear that it gets very confusing very quickly. And, and the big problem is where is everything? Where do I, where's the file that I need to get this project done? And that can be pretty stressful. <laughs> Yeah, and we call this, uh, there's a term for this, which is called SneakerNet, and sneaker gets pr SneakerNet progressively get, turns into a giant drive pyramid that often lives within an office closet somewhere that has lots of these different drives. Look, it's great for businesses, OWC, is it was we make lots of these different types of drives, and we can make a recommendation on all of these for you, but... Quite honestly, the best thing to do is to sort of plan out. And, and unfortunately, what happens for a lot of people who work at a facility that's growing is you don't really have the time to sit back. A lot of these moves become reactionary and you just buy what's there to solve a problem in, immediately. And then all of a sudden this balloons. And actually, over time, it costs you a lot more money than if you'd had the time to sort of step back and think about what proper growth can look like. And especially now in a hybrid world, when you need to be able to work with in-house and remote collaborators, this can become doubly frustrating as as things balloon and people don't know when they're coming back in the office and you need to buy drives for remote collaborators and in-house collaborators and all this stuff. The bottom line is uh, this is a solvable problem if you think about it from a big picture and you plan for some growth. And usually once you hit about your second editor, you tend to get ready for this next part. All right. Great. Lead into our favorite way to do uh, always uh, collaborative workflows with multiple people is through shared storage, such as a jellyfish. And the key difference here is that everybody just connects to it over a 10 gigabit ethernet cable. And now you're suddenly working on the same file system. So you can have different shares and volumes created, but everyone has access to everything equally. And so uh, this really helps you cut down on things like duplicate media, offline files, relinking, the time it takes to transfer, uh, and, and it actually opens up a bunch of additional uh, opportunities that aren't possible in the sneaker net world, like uh, metadata tagging, uh, which then allows you to search and discover things way quicker. And essentially, just it's finally an organized system where you actually know what you have and lets everybody just work. You're not wasting a bunch of time searching and digging and finding. Yeah, I mean, if you've ever worked in a collaborative setting with a bunch of different people who all own 
their own drive. Not only did you buy that same drive in media typically, and it's sitting across five drives, so you kind of wasted a lot of money there. But if you've ever had to ask the question uh, across the, the, where that drive pyramid is, hey, what file or, or what, what drive was that on? And you have to open the closet and go in there and literally unpack all of these and rewire those. And suddenly, Finding that file took an entire day of your life, and those are billable hours that accumulate over the course of life of something, whereas if everyone's just plugged into the same drive, the, you can start working at this and collaborating at the speed of thought versus really trying to figure out how to work with the person next to you or what drive that media was on or copying that drive from one. Oh, there's all these hidden costs and taxes and time and productivity that get lost in this. And the other thing that I would also think about too is as you start to build these strategies, really thinking through how you're naming media and sharing media and all of these things will save you endless amounts of time, cost of money, and that type of strategy and com creating a common language with the people you're collaborating with is probably the single biggest time and money saver that you can have as you, and standardizing the way that you name and label things and manage your media is, is those are the things that don't cost you a dollar. And if you think back to that, our, our earlier slide about collaboration, um, this type of model really enables every version of collaboration that, that we talked about. You know, not only is it a shared pool of media where you can have different editors working on different projects, it gives you that ability to hand off without a, a time penalty instead of like, okay, I finished my part and I'm gonna wait for an hour for it to transfer and then give it to someone else to do their part. It's basically as soon as I'm done with my part, I hit save, I close, the next person opens it, they start working in, literally instantaneously. And as you're going to see uh, coming up, you know, it, working from a shared environment like this with, with the jellyfish as a cent centerpiece also enables some pretty interesting hybrid workflows that we're going to cover in a second. And it sets the table where like if you've thought ahead and you thought, well, hey, I'd like everyone collaborating in the office this way. If you start extrapolating that to, well, maybe I have some remote collaborators who might benefit from from having centralized storage or a way to tap into a remote server environment that's designed for what video editors do, you're going to see how the benefits can kind of compound on top of this. Uh, sometimes editor, nice, or very simple way to do that is a, a portable, obviously like a laptop, MacBook Pro, and then uh, a portable high-speed drive that you can travel with very easily. And, and this is a, a great way to get started in a sometimes environment. And so literally, who is that for? Well, I'm literally that person right now. I'm currently in a hotel room at the moment and I carry around an Envoy Pro with me. And uh, basically that's the drive that's pictured here. It's the drive we're gonna be giving away again. And it's literally based on NVMe storage. A lot of times people will use those little orange drives and think that's a little bit the standard, but what you'll find is those are not optimized for editing. So when selecting a drive uh, that's small and portable, you wanna make sure that it's fast enough to uh, be able to handle media and the, the types of codecs that really editors are starting to use, which is like Red Media, Black Magic Raw, ProRes Raw, all those types of codecs. You want, uh, at, the nice thing about the Envoy Pro and the Thunder Blade, which is its bigger brother that can go up to 16 terabytes, is that they are built on NVMe-based storage, which is about the fastest storage that, that's known to man. We're giving away an Envoy Pro SX, which is Thunderbolt 3 based on NVMe. This is a crazy fast drive for the Mac that is in a very small form factor also worth considering is the Envoy Electron as well. But the bottom line is this is the drive that you bring with you uh, if you're at home and uh, you're and then basically you're gonna bring that back if you need to edit from it in the office. And what the biggest thing that it does is it also saves you uh, a ton of time in copying. If you've ever been out in the field and having to copy, you don't really wanna stay overnight with a slow drive uh, for a couple hours with large amounts of media. You want those copies to be quick and then you wanna to go to dinner and have a drink. This is well, a, great, a great solution for a lot of things. Uh, some of its weak points are the fact that, um, you know, typically on a, on a very, very portable situation like this, you're, you're going to have a capacity limit uh, and you're also going to have the fact that it's often not redundant. And so this is a really crucial moment to bring back up that, that footage integrity from the very beginning where uh, if, if you're working and you've copied your camera media onto this drive here, you wanna make sure you have some kind of other backup before you delete your card files and stick them back in the camera for the next day. The thing to think about here as we sort of look at this, you've got on the left-hand side, you have a, a home office, or you have a, a in-office computer, and on the right-hand side, you have a home office computer, and the plan is that you're gonna have a lot of media that you're copying onto both of these. So the important thing to do is have storage parity on both sides and have identical size drives. 
so that you can use a software utility like GoodSync and use your internet speed to maintain a sync between two of these drives uh, basically for free with, without having to pay for cloud storage. And you, you know, drives can be enormous. So on this side, we've got Thunder Bays, which can literally go into hundreds of terabytes that can literally be syncing just using your internet speed and a simple utility called GoodSync to go back and forth between these. And you can maintain syncing and collaboration without needing to use a shuttle drive, but you could also easily use an Envoy Pro or a Thunderblade to you know, do sneaker net between these two RAID setups to move media. But the idea is to have RAID parity between the home office and office setups, you know, with ideally the same type of drive and dock so that like you just don't have to worry about different sizes and these other things It's buy two of the same one and then work off each and, and then either shuttle or use, you know, sort of cloud to, to sync between the two. One of the ways I've seen this used most often is it's a lot of times it's both. So maybe uh, you've got an editor that comes into the office on Monday with a shuttle drive, they load up, you know, 30, 40 terabytes or something drive back home, there's no way you're going to be able to download it as quickly as just driving in as long as you live, you know, close enough to the office for that. Um, you bring that, but then that happens on Monday and then maybe on Tuesday, there's a new voiceover. Wednesday, there's a new graphic that got updated. And so then it's perfect for you to be able to use either that sync or you can use like third party solutions, like basic like Dropbox, Google Drive, uh, or something that's a little more elegant for video, like Frame.io, uh, where then you, it's great. These are great solutions for smaller files. But uh, again, the one downside, kind of the weakness there is you have to probably bug somebody at the office and say, hey, can you upload that file for me? It's it's new. I heard it. Somebody emailed me that it exists, but I can't get at it. So it's not quite as smooth. And yeah, this is not an either or thing. This is not about choosing between Dropbox and Google Drive and Frame.io and, you know, external storage. The idea is to use the right tool for the right thing. So, you know, have your primary media and storage living on an external drive and then be using smaller drives or using review links or uh, passing, you know, individual files or versions of files via these these cloud services is probably the most efficient way to manage these things. Uh, cloud storage can become very expensive once you start getting into terabytes. And the other thing too, is you want to be able to own your own data in some way. And the best way to do that is, use, is using external storage and to use these cloud services to move individual files or folders of media, or even have some of these in some cases live on external storage so that you're not having to pay the monthly costs. So this probably looks pretty familiar to what we looked at for the always environment. Uh, and Sam teased that earlier, and it's basically the same exact uh, setup. The only difference is that some of your users are gonna have a, a cloud connection. They're gonna be coming in over the internet instead of being physically connected on site with a wire. Yeah, and the thing that's really interesting about this is there's a couple different ways that they might be collaborating. They might be collaborating where the uh, Jellyfish uses a feature called Media Engine to generate proxies that are gonna be available to remote collaborators. Or you can cre even create custom shares on the Jellyfish that basically people would be able to come in and get a custom share for each collaborator, mount that share directly at home, or potentially even uh, sync you know, from the in-house collaboration tool, which is the Jellyfish, load into the Jellyfish and have that sync directly to a home raid, you know, and, and for however many shares they might want to do that with, you know, over the jellyfish. So there's a variety of different ways to use this, but, but the idea is that you can go from a centralized environment at, in the office to be able to hook into that centralized environment and directly add renders you know, for instance, you might be a collaborator who's doing VFX or color, be able to directly add renders to the jellyfish that all of your in-house collaborators would then immediately have access to can be a very useful thing that that's, you know, because basically if you're dealing with a lot of different people who work in an office, this is probably the most efficient way to share and collaborate with them. And I've seen this method work so well when you have, even if, even if again, like, let's go back to that example from the last slide where maybe you, you did load up a drive with 30 terabytes on Monday, you're back home. Now it's like if a new pickup shot comes in or you realize, oh, I need some B-roll of a drone shot that we shot two years ago, but I know it exists and I just didn't think to get it yesterday. It allows you just to natively browse the file structure just like you're in the office. The only difference, of course, is a little bit slower yeah, or a lot slower if you're on a bad internet connection. Um, but it gives you that ability to just function just as if you were in the office and, and be more fully independent. You can search for things, find things, pull them in, do all of your editing and get, get your work done. This is gonna be, uh, the example is, an, is someone who 
again, say maybe maybe your main office is based out of LA, but this person works out of New York, and but there are great callers and you want them to be part of your team. So it's just, this is how you would set that up. Yeah, and, and basically there's a couple different ways that this might happen, uh, where basically, you know, you have somebody who is collaborating and they're gonna download, sync, et cetera, uh, with a in-house raid that's going to sync to a portion of the jellyfish remotely. But another scenario that we're seeing a lot, specifically with the YouTube generation, is worldwide workflows that become pretty interesting, uh, where you might have a scenario where you might shoot something in-house or whatever, and you're gonna prep this edit, and then you're gonna leave, and you're gonna tell your team in Europe, hey guys, I've got a, you know, edit that's going uh, and here's the project file. Uh, I've generated some proxies for you to work from or you might even have it where they're, they're syncing up remotely and they can get access to small amounts of media, et cetera. They're going to go grab those either off the jellyfish and work directly or work directly off those proxies uh, on their system, edit, finish, and then uh, you wake up the next morning or your team wakes up and is able to get access to the edit and edit projects that they've been working from. Uh, in the States. And basically, you go in, finish your online color, get it up or, or export for the various versions and platforms. And you had an insanely efficient turnaround time working around the world, uh, you know, based on when people's optimal, you know, times are. And uh, it can be a very efficient way. We're seeing this, especially with a lot of YouTube content creators who have very compressed di- deadlines uh, are starting to work this way. Let's look at one more version of a never environment, and that is going to be what we call our dual headquarters never. So the two headquarters might have the same exact setup, um, but they never step foot in each other's offices. They could be, like like we talked about in the previous example, it could be an international kind of environment. And so there's a way to do that as well. And if you think about this, uh, this is almost like node to node, right? So you have a node with a few collaborators on it, and then there's another node with a few collaborators on it that might have remote collaborators hooking into one, but then could possibly access the other. Or you can access multiple nodes if you are a never collaborator going in and accessing two of these. You, you know, you have a lot of different ways to work, but it's really like thinking about, hey, I might have a uh, hub of people in Europe that all need to work together off a centralized environment. And then I might have another hub in Australia and I might have another hub in the States. And basically this allows anyone in the world essentially to tap into these different nodes that then anyone could also come in in person and access. So this hybrid workflow really working around the world with different nodes is is kind of the highest form if you if you have a large organization or a lot of different teams that need to be collaborating uh, of managing your media and data, you know, and, and also even possibly managing uh, backups to that data. Your situation may change and your budget level for a different project may change. So even at the smallest level, even if you're a solo road warrior, you may find yourself in an environment where you need to suddenly collaborate with people who are in a centralized environment. So the question is, how are you prepping your media? How are you naming your media? How are you managing your footage integrity in that pipeline so that And how are you communicating with your other collaborators? These are all the things that you should start thinking about from the very beginning as you approach these. And then start starting to assemble the right tools within your budget around the job is uh, the key part to stretching your budgets as far as humanly possible and making your clients happy. Awesome, you guys, let's get some questions going. Uh, First of all, Envoy Pro is only Mac, is that true? The Envoy Pro SX is Thunderbolt 3. Now you can use this uh, absolutely on PCs. They just need to have a Thunderbolt connection or, uh, and the Envoy Pro FX uh, gives you the option for USB-C as well. Uh, So the bottom line is it just has to be a Thunderbolt enabled computer and it's gonna work fine with the specific one we're giving away. But there's different flavors of the Envoy line that, you know, go at different speeds or have different connection types, but it's definitely Mac or PC. It just, for the Envoy lineup, you're going to need something that is either USB-C or or higher, which would include Thunderbolt 3. And I know that can be confusing, but I, I can go as deep into that as you want me to. Do these Envoy Pros have a removable element? They totally can. Uh, so the there is a, uh, what is the name of the Envoy uh, that has, you can put your own 
there is a container for the Envoy where you can totally put your own drive into it. And I think it's like 70 something dollars. So, and, and that's removable. You've got to have your own SSDs and, and sort of build your own Envoy. Uh, so that's definitely doable. Or you can, I forget exactly what it's called off the top of my head. Chris at OWC is going to be mad at me, but uh, we can totally follow up uh, on, on that for you and, and get you the name of it. But you totally can, or you can get uh, one from us, you know, with varying different speeds or connection types. If you already have a SAN in your office, is it worth switching to a NAS setup? Okay, this is a long conversation, SAN versus NAS. Uh, the, the short answer is how is your SAN currently performing? If you're happy with the performance and you're able to share media, uh, there's probably, uh, SAN versus NAS are fundamentally similar technologies uh, in the sense, but SAN is typically a little bit more cumbersome. The nice thing about Jellyfish is that it is, uh, IT list where anybody could use this uh, and you can plug in and quickly set up a room full of computers without needing an IT person. SANS typically require a lot more infrastructure handholding and, and usually a server room. So a lot of it depends on, on what you're trying to do and why, uh, but fundamentally they do achieve the same purpose, which is enabling you know shared environments. And then it's really just a question on whether your SAN is doing everything that you need it to be doing and you're able to, to share and collaborate. And that's really, that depends often on how old it is, who made it, who's running it and, and how they're integrating. So that's a long way of saying uh, sometimes. Instead of working off several drives uh, and then in parentheses, uh, ca uh, cache project files, footage backup, are these editors working off of the one Thunder Bay? Only a single editor can work off of Thunder Bay. In order to work collaboratively, you would be on a Jellyfish because that's what enables uh, multiple editors to access the same hard drive, I guess, at the same time. That's the Jellyfish capability, uh, which is really, to that's what a NAS is. It's fundamentally built on a NAS technology. And a Jellyfish is a NAS that's optimized for video workflows. Uh, so within that, a Thunder Bay is really like any sort of rated group of drives. You're gonna plug those in via Thunderbolt 3, typically into a Mac, and you can edit at the speed of those like four or eight drives is, is what the different Thunder Bays are. But it's basically um, just a single drive chassis that is rated for optimal speed and, and transfer times and, and uh, storage capacity. Just to piggyback off that, on the because maybe what the question was getting at was in the Jellyfish environment, you can create multiple, we call them shares, but they're essentially like virtual hard drives and you can designate things like this is going to be for projects, this is going to be for media, this is going to be for static assets or whatever it might be. You can design that system however you want for your needs. Uh, and, and like Sam said, it's designed to be IT less. It's really easy as a user to get in there and you say, I want to create a share. Here's the quota. Here's the size of it. Here's the users that need to access it. It's within seconds, you can have a new share up and running. Do the synchronizing features with Jellyfish require a subscription at all? When you are in an in-person uh, collaborative environment, there is no additional like per user, you know, licensing or anything like that. Even, even some of the more advanced software features that come with it are included for every user that can connect. Uh, the one difference is the remote access, the Jellyfish remote access component does have a subscription, monthly subscription, but you can turn that on and off. So if you need it some of the year, certain months, you can activate it for that. If you don't need it for part of the year, you don't have to pay for that. It also never affects your data. So if you don't have it, you, d you will never lose data. You always own your data. Any examples of a Jellyfish being used in a highly secure network? Does it play well with complex network security, VPN, et cetera? Yes and no. So the the uh, a lot of it we need to know your specific security environments. Uh, we can get Jellyfish to pass the highest level of enterprise security environments. But the real question, basically, if it's compatible with any kind of NAS and your security, uh, then yes, it also can live on its own network and be completely tied down. Uh, it it can be encrypted. There's lots of different things we can do. What I'd recommend you do is set up a workflow call with us, which is you would do through uh, the email on the screen right now. And uh, we can go real deep on that. And it's a free call and we, we can get, you know, for things like that, we'll just, we'll go deep with you. Well, a huge thank you, Stephen and Sam. Uh, very clear, very informative. We had great questions. So thank you so much to our members for asking great questions, to our panelists, and also to our partners, Adobe, 
Blackmagic, OWC, and Sony at the gold level, AJA, Isotope, SGO, and Zeiss at the silver level. And we have a bunch of other companies uh, that help get the word out about our group. We have supporting partners, media partners, and community partners. Head to our YouTube channel to see our uh, brand new video that we put up from our June meeting. And that's a uh, high-end remote post-production with Andy Bellamy. Um, he's the product marketing manager at AJA. And we also celebrated LAPPG's 13th anniversary. So um, come take a look and see if you missed it. We also have about 65 videos on our YouTube channel. So be sure to check that out. And connect with us on Instagram. We would love you to follow us and we will follow you. Make sure you use the hashtag LAPPG. We unfortunately lost a dear member of our community and of the greater Hollywood LA community, um, Dan Neese, who has been uh, a member and presenter at LAPPG for a long time, has passed away. Um, this has been a really, a really sad thing to, to learn. Dan has always been such a, a gentle, humble spirit. Uh, he's very welcoming at our meetings and um, he was always really open about sharing his expertise and his knowledge with the community, with people. If you would go up and speak with him, he was like immediately, he would just start chatting and, and sharing stuff with you. Um, Dan was a, a legendary uh, Steadicam operator and a cinematographer in his own right. Um, and some of his films, uh, Blue Velvet comes to, to Mulholland Drive, Jackie Brown. And we had eight cameras running at once because each clown performance was unique and we couldn't go back and like pick it up. Dan will be sorely missed in our community. And we do thank Dan for all the support he's shown us and the friendship that he's given us over the years.